Um, so welcome. This is the SOFLUX webinar. Um, the goal is for SOFLUX is to have a roughly monthly webinar that addresses air sea flux issues in the Southern Ocean. Today, we're really fortunate to have Peter Sutherland presenting on air sea interactions in the Polar Pod project. So he'll explain what that's about. Peter uh, did his a bachelor's degree at the University of Victoria, and then did a PhD at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where he worked on waves and turbulence. Um, he moved from there to a postdoc uh, in Paris, and since um, 2015, he's been at Ephraimer in Brest, although he's currently sitting at the University of British Columbia in um, Vancouver. So, we're happy to have him here presenting on this, and I'll let you take it away, Peter. All right. Um, well, thanks, Sarah, and thanks to all of you for having me. Um, so I was asked to give a brief introduction to the Polar Prod project. Uh, and before I do that, and it will be brief, I will give, I will just make a couple of points. One is that this is the work of a lot of people, not just me, obviously. Um, and the second is that through most no fault of my own, I've ended up um, directing one of the scientific work packages on this project related to air-sea fluxes. Um, and this is, I suppose, because I have a little bit of expertise in air-sea flux type measurements, but I will point out right now to this community that I have no expertise whatsoever in the Southern Ocean. So um, meeting this community will be certainly valuable for me as well. And so I'll start off with a very short introduction to the project, and then some of our motivations and then some more details about the project and some of our scientific schemes. Uh, so, polar pod. Basically, polar pod is the the idea is to have a drifting platform experiment that was inspired by research pat platform flip in the Southern Ocean. Um, so this is a project that uh, I imagine many of you have heard about on and off over the years. It's been going on for at least a decade now. Uh, it's being led by Jean-Louis Etienne, who is a, I suppose you could say he's like France's version of David Attenborough or something like that. He's most well known for um, walking to the North Pole, I believe. And, but there's a large scientific component as well. And the chief scientist leading that is uh, David Anton, who's at Curtin University in Australia and also at CNRS. So this picture that I've got on the, can you see my mouse? Hopefully. Um, on the, the left panel here is a, like a, uh, a rendering of what the, this vessel is supposed to look like. Basically, it's a uh, free drifting vertical spar buoy. It's about 125 meters long. And so that's uh, for, with 40 meters of that roughly above the water. And I should say, I'm gonna show a fair number of diagrams of this vessel, um, but it's important to note that the the final design has not been approved yet. And so there may be some minor or not so minor changes that will be made to the, the design, um, depending on who ends up constructing it. Um, but the point is that it's designed for to be a stable platform with minimal airflow distortion, minimal wave disruption, and a crew of about seven or eight people. So that would be three actual sailors and four scientific people. And then on the right the, of this, um, slide, you, you can see a diagram of the Southern Ocean with a ship track crudely drawn on it. And so basically the mission plan for this experiment is to tow this vessel south of South Africa and then drift eastward in the ACC for three years. And so roughly, like if you plan, plan on like a half meter per second drift velocity, which is partly wind drift and partly current drift, um, that ends up being something like uh, one to two circumnavigations in that time period. Um, and so we'd be, and to be clear, we're talking about like a, around 40 south to 60 south. Um, so the scientific plans we have for this are kind of broken down into four main um, components or work packages. <clears throat> First one is ocean atmosphere exchanges of uh, momentum, energy, and mass. So this is things like small scale air sea interface dynamics, um, and then slightly larger scale, so meso and some meso scale dynamics, as well as a large component on supporting wind and wave satellite missions, um, looking at specifically CO2 fluxes as well, and looking at aerosol sources and fluxes. And then, the, and so I'm gonna mostly talk about this first 
or the, this first uh, components today, but we, there are also large components on um, bio optics and supporting ocean color satellite missions. Um, a huge component on biodiversity, looking at everything from phytoplankton up to uh, whales and charismatic megafauna, of one sort or another. And then there's another component on anthropogenic influence, so microplastics, chemical pollution, this sort of thing. And then, especially considering who's running the project, uh, there's a very large component on outreach and education as well, um, which is being developed currently. So a little bit for the motivation of this project. Uh, as I said earlier, you, you, this community knows quite a bit more about this than I do. Um, but basically, we, we, there's this idea that uh, the Southern Ocean um, flows around the, 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 wor the, the, the world, I suppose you could say, uh, without being interrupted by continents. So as in this diagram from Lumpen and Spirit, everyone likes to show, it kind of, it's kind of a way of connecting the ocean basins. And it's a key area for air sea exchanges, um, for example, and largely driven by, well, many things. Um, one of which is a very high local wind speed on average, which uh, I'm showing in this sort of bottom right plot here. And, then, and so this is, you know, the Southern Ocean represents something like 20% of the ocean area, but supports uh, about 40% of anthropogenic CO2 flux and 75% of ocean heat uptake. Um, and it so obviously plays a key role in regulating the earth climate. Um, and it's important for exporting nutrients to lower latitudes and oxygenating the deep oceans. And from a biological point of view, it's a huge reservoir of biodiversity and a huge reservoir of edible biomass for us, I suppose. Um, the problem is that the Southern Ocean is very remote. It's far from major ports um, and it's strongly forced or stormy. So it's, basically it's extremely difficult to access and it's never cheap to access. And this ends up re resulting in a rather under sampling of the region compared to other oceans and particularly a seasonal bias towards the summer in the sampling of the area. So with this, this in mind, the Polypod project was born. Um, and so the idea is that we wanted to have a long-term presence there in a stable platform that could continue to do science when weather was rough. Um, so thus the Sparboy design, uh, it's made, as I said, for a reduced airflow distortion. So it has this relatively small superstructure and doesn't disrupt the wave field, drifts uh, as a quasi-Lagrangian platform. Um, and the experiments designed for this are designed to take advantage of that. Um, so a couple of things that you can do very well from a platform like this, which you really can't do from a ship too well, is make eddy correlation measurements of energy, momentum, and mass. Um, and this is because of its stability and lack of airflow distortion. And we can come back and discuss that point later. And then it, it also, of course, doesn't disrupt the wave field too much because of the very small water plane. Um, and because it's a semi-Lagrangian study, you, you kind of passively move with a particular water mass and you can study its evolution. And the, the idea is the platform is also to be quiet, so you can, uh, it should be good for passive acoustic monitoring as well. Um, and then the deployment schedule is, so the idea is we have this very long deployment schedule so we can capture a broad range of conditions and capture the seasonal cycle and so on. And again, the stability allows us to sample high wind and wave conditions. Um, and yeah. So the, and, and so I, I will just pause for a moment to say that this is not such a crazy idea as it may look like. Um, so FLIP was designed in 19, or launched in 1962 and has kind of been the backbone of air-sea interaction research ever since um, for, for three or four decades now at least um, for studies of waves, upper ocean turbulence and atmospheric fluxes specifically. So this picture on the right is from uh, Tico Universitas Nature Paper in 2003 showing flip with a boom mounted at the side and a, an array of sonic anemometers and various other anemometers 
It was designed to look at airflow over waves. Um, and, and so just a, for example, we, we, well, I've listed a few papers here that have resulted from, from FLIP, but actually there are far more. And if you look at the RC interactions literature, even if you find a paper that doesn't use FLIP, specifically, often they're going to use some sort of parameterization that was based on FLIP measurements, or they're going to use FLIP measurements to correct the measurements that they use. Um, and this is true for even very well-known parameterizations like the core algorithm. Um, so PolarPod has been based on FLIP, um, but taking advantage of some 60 years of advances in uh, naval architecture, mostly coming from the offshore oil and gas industry. So it will be purpose built for the, the Southern Ocean Drift Experiment. Um, so the, this will be specifically, it will tolerate a higher sea, sea state due to a higher freeboard and a lower resonance frequency. Um, and it will be designed to be a little more autonomous. So it will be mostly powered by renewable energy. So we have these um, wind generator, wind turbines at the top of the platform um, with diesel backup, of course, and improved livability inside. So anyone who's worked on FLIP knows that it can be a little bit rugged and it would be especially rugged to be in the Southern Ocean for a couple of months or not. And then uh, for navigation, it has the, these kind of sails to help direct its movement. So can you see my mouse? Maybe. Anyway, we have, uh, we have this vertical platform, we have a, a living quarters on top of it, and then we have these two booms which are used to lower instruments into the water and also support these sail structures, which will kind of allow it to drift to, to the left or right somewhat as it moves downwind um, in principle. Oh, that's odd. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, so that's a, a person size to give you an idea of the scale of this platform. Um, and so here's another diagram. So uh, as I said, it's, it's about 120 meters high. So we have 75 meters underwater. We have a large ballast keel at the bottom and we have flotation. And then we have this uh, vertical spar passing through the, uh, the water plane. And then we have this purple structure where people live and work. So lab space and living quarters and so on. We have these green uh, sails, wind turbines, and a mast that extends somewhere between 40 and 45 meters above the sea surface. Um, particular interest to this group uh, would be the flux boom, which is mounted uh, on the upwind side of the vessel. Um, it's, it's planned to be 20 meters long, extending upwind. So to be in a region that's without airflow distortion around the hull. And it has a vertical flux boom that will be somewhere between five and 10 meters, depending on the structural capabilities of the manufacturer, I suppose. Um, and so the idea is that it gets towed into location in the horizontal position, just like flip. Um, it gets ballasted from, uh, to flip from horizontal to vertical position, and it will rest in the vertical position for the entire deployment. Um, and one cool thing about it is it will have an adjustable water line to allow it to adapt to the sea state. So you can move the, the entire structure up or down. So I believe it's around five meters. And so the deployment we have planned. So we'll start in, uh, starting in March of 2021, there was an official announcement. And then March to December of this year, the, it's out to public tender for the construction. Ideally, the construction will start in January of 2022 and be finished uh, about a year later. And then in the summer of 2023, it'll be launched and sea trials will start. And then 2020, at the beginning of 2024, it will be uh, towed to South Africa and will begin its deployment in the Southern Ocean. And then it will continue around the Southern Ocean for three years. Um, so this is just a snapshot view. This plot on the right here is just a snapshot view of uh, current velocity um, from altimetry, satellite altimetry. The scale is from uh, zero to 50 centimeters a second. 
and the, this orange line is the projected polar pod drift track. So obviously no one's going to stay on the, the ship for three years, and if you, even if you could, you could probably not feed yourself. Um, so the, the plan is to resupply it every two months. So the, these plots down at the bottom here are the earth, and the, the green track is the, polar, the projected polar pod track. And the red track is a resupply vessel. So there will be a dedicated resupply vessel. Um, the details have not been finalized on that yet, although it seems that it will probably end up being a vessel of something like Terra. Um, and so every two months, the polypod will be resupplied, and the, the resupply vessel will kind of slowly circumnavigate the world with polypods. So it will you know, drop off its supplies, then meet it two months later down the line, and stop at a new port on land get more supplies, trade crew, et cetera. I should say resupply and also crew changes. Um, and this will continue the whole way around the, the circumnavigation. So scientific objectives, I guess the key goal here is to provide the measurements that we need to understand model and uh, remotely sense air sea exchanges of mass. So like CO2, um, fresh water, aerosols, momentum, and currents, and energy, so heat and movement between the atmosphere and the ocean in the Southern Ocean. And as I said, you guys know this much better than me, but um, these fluxes in the Southern Ocean are key uncertainty in climate models. Um, and I guess a contributor to that uncertainty is that the, they're based on the, the, the fluxes themselves are thought to be dominated by short-term intense storm events this is because typically these exchange co coefficients go with something like uh, u star cubed, or the exchanges rather not the coefficients go with something like u star cubed, um, which means that if you, it doesn't take long at a high wind speed to make up for months and months of moderate wind speeds. Um, but unfortunately, high wind flux measurements are extremely difficult to make and they're rare. And so there, there certainly have been some advances made, particularly in tropical cyclones, but uh, due to sea state differences, it's not obvious that those would, of course, those are valid in the Southern Ocean. Um, and so typically models and bulk parameterizations are based on uh, observations and data sets from lower latitudes, so it's in weaker conditions. And, and this ex extrapolation is definitely known to not work 100%, and it's known to be error prone. And I guess the, the level of uncertainty is unknown, unknown. Um, so that's why I like to show this picture on the right. So basically, flex parameterizations are based on the top picture, but um, and then they're extrapolated to the bottom picture, and they should really be based on the bottom picture as well. All right, and so. Oceanographers love to show this plot. Basically, on the abscissa, we have a length scale, and on the ordinate, we have a time scales. And so, in models, we're kind of able to resolve most of the large scale processes that we see in this uh, the, the top left box called resolved. I mean, they, our goal obviously is to, to make predictions and projections about large scale processes like climate change and basin scale variability and whatnot. The problem is that we need to parameterize the sm small scale processes that we can't resolve. Um, and so that is things like high frequency internal waves and 3D turbulence and surface waves and things like that. Um, and so the, one of the cool things about the polar pod project is that we'll be there for a long time. So we'll at least resolve some of the time scales up here, but we'll also be able to make the small scale measurements down here over that time period. And so I uh, hear a few more scientific objectives. And I should say that there, there are many more objectives than just these. These are just a few that have been picked out to appeal to this community. Um, so one of the key things for these flux parameterizations, for example, is understanding the evolution of the surface wave spectrum, um, particularly at small scale and some high winds, and then understanding mixed layer response to surface forcing. Um, there's been some work that's come out recently that's shown that mixed layers have been deepening over the world's oceans. Um, and it seems like that is in response to surface forcing. And so then the, the question is, how does that forcing actually work? Um, and then also to put new constraints on uh, seasonal CO2 fluxes, 
with continuous direct measurements, um, both using Reynolds fluxes directly and also using partial pressure measurements. Um, and then testing the validity, validity of indirect measurements techniques as well, which are the sorts of sensors that we would put on autonomous vehicles and buoys and such. Um, and then characterize marine aerosol emissions as well, both at short time scales and event driven processes, as well as seasonal and basin scale. Um, and so then we also have some key objectives related to remote sensing. Um, and so this, as I mentioned previously, there are remote, other remote sensing topics related to ocean color, um, but specifically relating to fluxes, there, there's kind of a need to improve the geophysical model functions in many of the satellite projects at higher winds. And so this could be, or just in that region in general. So this could be, for example, um, working on sea state biases in scatterometer or uh, altimeter derived winds. And this could be uh, also, for example, improving uh, radiometric estimates of high winds in uh, well, radiometers like uh, SMOS, for instance. And so this is important because scatterometers, for example, they, they kind of saturate at around 20 meters a second wind speed um, and respects that there are higher winds a lot. More. There, there are higher winds that also wouldn't really like to resolve. As I mentioned previously, they're, they're key for short event driven RC fluxes. Um, and so products like SMOS, for example, give us the ability to estimate winds at higher wind speeds from satellites. Um, and this would also be relevant for things like um, surface waves and currents from satellites. So, for example, SAR products currently um, and active Doppler radars like CFOSAT and CSTARS. Um, so ColorPod originally was planned to be in the water at the same time as CFOSAT. Now it seems like CFOSAT will be finished before ColorPod is in the water and it's not clear if CSTARS will be in the water um, or in the air in orbit um, at the same time as ColorPod or not, but at the very least, the sort of work will help with the, the, the groundwork for um, developing GMS for those satellites as well. Um, and so the, the advantages here, are, of course, we have this very long-term exposure to severe weather on the stable platform. We can measure things like RC fluxes that we can't really from a ship. And we, we have ocean platforms like um, Fino, for example, or many oil platforms, but most of those are not in open ocean conditions either. Uh, so what do we need? Well, we need direct measurements of Reynolds fluxes, momentum, latent and sensible heat, and CO2. We need radiative fluxes, so upwelling and downwelling, um, short wave and long wave. We need marine aerosols, cloud condensation, nuclei, and ocean spray. And we need uh, air water CO2 concentration. Of course, we need the standard met observations. And we need surface wave field. And by that, I don't mean just like a time series of surface elevation. I mean, we, um, the full K omega spectrum. And then we, we need to measure the upper ocean response as well. So like standard CD profiles and mixed layer depth and whatnot, as well as uh, upper ocean turbulence structure. So here's what we're planning for that. This is um, the, the grayed out instrumentation has not been funded and the, the, uh, the black instrumentation is well on its way to being purchased. Um, so to start off with, we have our Eddyflux system. So this would be a set of three sonic anemometers, two GLI 350s and the Windmaster Pro, um, and a couple of ocean open path gas analyzers for CO2 and H2O and water. Um, and then the net radiometer for radiative fluxes, um, stereo and polarimetric cameras for short wavelength uh, surface wave field. Um, and we've not yet finalized the UAV program, but we've left open space for launching and landing the things. Um, and the expectations that these would be used for understanding the larger scale spatial structure surrounding the platform. This is obviously a question that everyone has about a single point drifting platform, um, as well as making atmospheric profiles and so on. And then, We've got various radiometers available. Uh, of 
course, all the instrumentation has to be geo-referenced and synchronized. And so we've got uh, various motion packages for that. Got our standard MET sensors mounted high on the mast here, uh, as well as cameras looking at the sea surface for things like um, spray coverage and breaking and so on. X-band wave radar, a uh, Curios instrument for uh, aerosol size distribution, cloud concentration nuclei, laser wave gauges, and in situ CO2 concentration measurements. Um, and then underwater, we have uh, some fixed temperature and salinity sensors, which are mounted on the hull, as well as uh, profiling CTD down to 1,000 meters, and uh, ADCPs looking from the surface down to about 1,000 meters as well. Also in the water, there's the idea is to have uh, some small AUVs and gliders to, again, measure the horizontal homogeneity or lack thereof surrounding polar pod. Um, so basically, the idea is we, we, we've developed this instrumentation system, which should allow us to measure both small scale processes and their bulk effects. So it allow us to be able to close um, energy and momentum budgets and so on. So that's the rough idea. Where we are currently is, as I said, the, the, the project is out to public tender for construction. Um, key instrumentation is nearly finalized. If anyone has clever ideas, I guess now is the time. So basically, I should say we, we have like a set of key instrumentation that will be on all the time. And then afterwards, there will be room to add more within the space and power constraints of the project. Um, we're ref refining the science plan as we speak. And we'll be, we'll be open to international collaboration soon. And suggestions are very welcome. And there will, of course, be questions about who is paying for this. So the first of all, I don't really know. Um, so the French government is paying for the construction of the polar pod. And the instrumentation has been supported by IFMR, IFMR CNRS, and uh, CNES. Um, and there's also been a good deal of philanthropic funding from private partners. So that's. I think enough. If you have questions, I'm here to hopefully answer them. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, this was great. Um, and we can now open it up for questions. You can raise your hand uh, if you have questions or put them in the chat. And maybe just to get things started, I'll, I'll ask a, one of the first questions that came to my mind, um, the science party is pretty small. Is there a sense of limitations in what the science party will, will, and the crew will be able to do, uh, given yeah, that so, it's not so many people on board? So this is a major problem and it's come up over and over, uh, somewhat to a lesser degree for us doing the physics side of things than for the biologists, because we don't need to process samples or anything like this. We just basically need to maintain the instrumentation running. Um, but it, that is definitely a limitation that we have come up against. And there's been a fair bit of activity planning, like actual days of work to make sure that everything can be done. And so this is why in the instrumentation I've just described, a lot of it's really designed to run on its own. And then data can be sent back to shore to be checked by a larger group of people supporting it on shore. Thanks. I see that Bruno has his hand up and then Brian Ward after that. I thank you, Peter, for, for your presentation. I'm just wondering if there is some plan. Well, I acknowledge that uh, CO2 flux is a pretty relevant in the Southern Ocean. Just wondering if there are some plan to measure other gases like uh, DMF or nitrous oxide, methane. Um, this is a good question. And so it's been discussed. And I think the, the project would be open to it, depending on, again, space power constraints. Um, but it's, it's definitely been encouraged. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Hi, Peter. That's a really nice presentation. 
Um, this is more of a technical comment. The, um, with regard to the anticovarian CO2 fluxes, we found that it's necessary to remove the water vapor. And so putting a LIPOR 7500 out on the boom may not uh, produce quality CO2 fluxes. So, you so want this, this is a, a commentary I've heard before, and I, I know you know a lot about this, so I'd be very interested to know how you would do this. Okay, I can, I can send you some uh, documents and, um, uh, or we can have an offline discussion, no problem. Yeah. Sure, that would be good. Because if you're going to go, all to, go to all this effort, and CO2 fluxes are one of the uh, objectives, then I suspect that if you just deploy an open path for, you know, you, you won't get quality CO2 fluxes from that. So you don't want to waste the effort and uh, time. For sure. Yeah. Um, the, the other question that struck me was, um, are, are you doing subsurface turbulence or is that going to be done from the gliders that you launch? Is that the so idea? This, the idea was to use the, the gliders and AUVs for that because of course, if you have a, a 120 meter long string stick, you will not necessarily measure representative turbulence. And so the other idea was to lower things off of the booms. And so this is something that has worked in the past off flip. Uh, and so that would be pursued as well, but it's not something that would be more of a punctual measurement. It's not something that we can leave there the whole time. Okay. Because of the manning requirements. Okay. Thanks. Sia yeah, has her hand up. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on what's the plan for the data management and uh, distribution. Yeah, so data management, obviously, as much data as we can send back to shore, we'll send back to shore straight away to be quality control. But the reality is that some of these instruments capture a great deal of data. And so this would be sent back every two months with resupplies. Um, afterwards, the, the project is committed to various ideals of open data, although the exact mechanism for that has not yet been decided upon. Um, but the idea is that the, the data should be accessible to the community relatively quickly. If I can ask another question, I was curious, we usually think about measuring 10 meter winds and this is gonna have a boom that's much higher than 10 meters. Is there thought about how to make that conversion or whether that matters? Yeah, so typically that conversion would be made using a log profile estimate. Mm -hmm. um, and so this would be definitely nice to have a actual 10 meter wind measurement as well. It seems like this will may be technically difficult to do and also susceptible to breaking because mm -hmm. when you have larger than 10 meter waves, that becomes a problem for wind sensors. So we'll probably have to be stuck with the log profile estimate. But we could also, I said, the, the thing is that if we want to measure 10 meter winds, we, we could obviously mount a the wind sensor rate on the hull at 10 meters, but then we have the, the hull that's distorting the wind flow also. So we would have to have a boom extending from the hull at 10 meters. <laughs> and it's not obvious how easy that would be to do, but it's certainly something that we've considered. In Personally, that I think the community should get off 10 meter winds anyway. <laughs> we should just talk about stress directly. But which might imply a, a one meter wind. <laughs> um, in that regard, has there been any modeling of the flow distortion around us and what that will do to the sensors on the boom or on the main structure? Not yet. So the, 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 and the reason for that is because the, the design has not been finalized. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've, to, to select boom lengths and so on for the flux measurements, we've just been using, just scaling it by the size of the platform itself. 
So we're saying, okay, the platform is a diameter of X, and so we have to have a, the, the boom longer than X, basically. Mm -hmm. Which is, I think, not as crazy as it sounds. Thanks. Are there additional questions? Yeah, Peter, are there any plans for like kind of submissions within the larger deployment? So if you wanted to address the question that you and Sarah were talking about, maybe do a two month experiment in the spirit of what Laurent did on flip. Yeah, so this is this has been discussed since the beginning, and that's definitely the plan. Um, the idea would be. Obviously, we need to have continuous measurements of many things and the more people that get added to the project, the more people want continuous measurements. But um, within that, we've also planned for various two months deployments would be devoted to, for example, this sort of thing, or an especially high resolution measurement of the surface wave field or whatever, right? Or some biological sampling. Cool, thanks. The, the challenge is that there's a fair bit of like, it, like from the physics point of view, it's really the platform that makes this an interesting experiment. But for the biology point of view and the pollution point of view, it's really more the duration. And so they really want the long time series. And so we have to keep doing all the other measurements as well, which constrains how much extra can be added. Cool, thanks. Maybe. Um... I have the wrong perspective, but that sounds slightly, the Southern Ocean is biologically so inhomogeneous that the long time series seems like it won't be a very clean time series for biology. I don't think they ever are. Um, oh. no, yeah, that's quite likely to be true. Is there a sense if this is supposed to circumnavigate does Antarctica one or two times? Will it be hauled out at the end of the two-year mission, where whatever longitude it's at, or is there some flexibility to figure so, out exactly where to, how to retrieve it at the end? So basically, the the mission time, which is planned for three years, is based on how much funding there is for the project. Mm -hmm. And so, presumably, if, if it was cheaper to let it drift a little bit longer to a better place than to send a tugboat to go and fetch it then that would be done. Or if it was cheaper to pick it up a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. that would also be done. I should say also that after this experiment is over, the idea is then that Corypod will um, join the French Oceanographic Fleet, which can be used for uh, experiments, again, anywhere in the world, as long as you can get it there, I suppose. But I expect after three years in the Southern Ocean, there'll be a significant refit before it gets used again. Any other questions? I think this is really exciting. I think there are going to be lots of questions about how people can be asked how people can access the data or get involved or contribute to the types of submissions that Nick was talking about. Um, yeah. and how to integrate this with the broader community efforts in the Southern Ocean. For sure. Um, it's been a little bit funny because it's kind of been yeah. There's been pressure to keep this within the French community until the project mm -hmm. is fairly, fairly well developed. Um, but I think it's very rapidly approaching the stage where it is well developed enough that the larger international, mm -hmm. international community can start to be a part of it. And I think that you know, this makes obvious sense, right? Like the mm -hmm. international, there's expertise in the international community that we don't have. Um, 
and outreach is a big part of this. Is there a sense of what form of outreach there's going to be? Continuous television cameras or a documentary or? Um... So for it to go by Jean Lietin's past work, there would be documentaries, books, and but um, the, the outreach is actually planned to be more um, direct interaction with schools. Mm -hmm. So they're developing an a, a education program for I guess we would call it K-12 education related to polar pod. That sounds like it'll be really fun. And, and so, so the person organizing that is Severine Elva. Mm -hmm. I don't think I listed her name, but I should have. Um, and it, my guess is that will be reasonably successful because it is a super bizarre sort of experiment, which uh, like it is technically interesting and scientifically interesting. It's a cool part of the world. So, and generally, Tim definitely has experience in public outreach. Like this is how he's made his living for forty years. Oh, well, if there are no further questions, um, we can wrap up now. Thank you very much, Peter. This is really exciting. Yeah. Um, this is a pleasure. And um, oh, I, I look forward to working with some of you in the future on this project. Yeah. Definitely will be some benefits for the community.